Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, just to let you know, this event is being recorded and it will be available afterwards on the Lay Memorial Library's YouTube channel. So if you know someone that wanted to be here and they couldn't, they can access it there afterwards. And that can, of course, be found on our website or our Facebook page. One second, let me admit these people. And we, of course, here for this virtual event, we are where we are exploring the history of Rockrest. Uh, this presentation will, of course, focus on the human stories and restrictions that created this now historic landmark that is located in Kittery, Maine. Rockrest was a place for African Americans vacationing in Maine. And I am pleased, of course, to introduce Noor Shoup, a Kittery resident, resident who serves as a Sankofa scholar and a tour guide for the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire, and Bob Shepard, who is a broadcast journalist and who worked at WZEA in Hampton. I didn't even know we had a radio station in Hampton at some point. Um, we are, of course, um, they're going to be our guides tonight. Uh, my name is Stacey Mazur and I am the assistant director at the Lane Library and I will be our virtual monitor tonight. And as monitor, um, I am asking, of course, that we all keep our cameras and microphones turned off for this event. Questions can be shared through the chat function in Zoom with me, and then I will share them with the presenters. And at the end of the presentation, I would love for you to go ahead and give us some feedback. I have a, a feedback form that you can fill out, and that will um, be a great way for us to improve what we're doing and um, see how you like these programs. Okay. <clears throat> I'd like to say a big thank you to the Lane Library for the invitation to share the story of the couple who opened their Kittery home to Black vacationers during a time of great change in America. First, a little bit about our organization, the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire, based in Portsmouth. We promote awareness and appreciation of African American history and life in order to build more inclusive communities today. Through guided tours and programs like this presentation, we strive to share unvarnished stories describing 400 years of Africans and their descendants living in New Hampshire. Tonight, we're going to introduce you to Hazel and Clayton Sinclair, share some photographic images and memories of Rock Rest. We will go back in time to look at the social and political history that inspired Rock Rest and similar guest homes in the seacoast, and hopefully have some time at the end to answer some of your questions. Um, I would like to start with land acknowledgement of the indigenous peoples. When the colonials arrived here, it was not vast empty land. There were uh, first nations that actually were here, the Abenaki, real people of the East, Wabanaki, peoples of Dawnland, Penacook, people of, at the bottom of the hills, and Kawasak, people of the pines. And um, when we are in the, um, question and answer segment of our program, uh, the community dialogue group agreement that we use at Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire is be respectful, listen, share airtime, focused on the idea, not the person, be present, be crisp and say what is core, be open-minded, honor confidentiality. It's okay to put issues like race and class on the table take risks, be raggedy, make some mistakes, then let go. The seeds of this story were planted a century ago and new disruptive technology began to take hold in America. The automobile, a symbol of freedom brought about change on every level of our society. Mass production of Ford's Model T began in 1913. Folks could expect to pay $400 for a new car. A decade later, Americans could afford used cars for as little as $100, which was a couple months salary. By 1929, Americans wanted their own cars and everything that it promised. The car offered many Americans the ability to see the country for the first time. Without the constraint of public transportation like the extensive trolley system, that made it possible for people to move about the seacoast. They could be spontaneous, taking Sunday joy rides to visit scenic spots like Novel Light. Following the Second World War, things changed. A broad range of employment opportunities, a five-day work week, and federal investment in a national highway system made travel possible for millions of people. New industries sprung up. 
catering to those travelers, Americans embrace the opportunity to travel freely. Families could leave big cities traveling together for a week's vacation or send their children to one of the many summer camps on the lakes in New Hampshire and Maine. The car makers recognize this new market segment creating ads like this one targeting black buyers. Buying a car freed African-Americans from the indignities of riding the bus, train or streetcar where they were required to sit or stand in designated areas or give up seats to white passengers. For blacks whose families had moved north from areas to take free jobs in the cities during the period known as the Great Migration, a car provided them the ability to go back home to visit relatives on their own schedule to attend funerals, weddings, and family reunions. But for the growing number of middle-class Black families, those trips were anything but carefree. Even something as simple as a two-day weekend getaway required extensive planning and organization. Travelers had to make sure the vehicle was in working order, that the route was all laid out in advance with little left to chance, and most important thing, that the overnight accommodations were confirmed. It meant packing everything into the car, including food for the trip, because there might not be places where they could stop when hunger called. While other travels could stretch their legs and use the public restrooms, Blacks often had to hold it until they could pull off the road someplace safe and use the woods. Those were different times, a concept that many young people today have a hard time coming to terms with. This is a photo of a rest stop for Greyhound bus passengers traveling between Louisville, Kentucky and Nashville, Tennessee with separate accommodations for colored passengers and a blatant reminder that some in America were less than equal. This photo is a courtesy of the Farm Security Administration. It was a time of legal segregation when America was divided by race. Postal signs were blatant as was the case down south, but Northern states, black Americans devised other ways of knowing where they could safely stop to eat, buy clothing, fill up or gasoline, buy gasoline or get their car repaired. Access to businesses and public accommodations was limited stemming from the Jim Cross laws passed in the decades following the Civil War, serving to marginalize African-Americans, denying them the right to vote, hold jobs, get an education, or travel freely. Those who attempted to defy Jim Crow laws often faced arrest, fines, jail sentences, violence, even death. Jim Crow is a racial stereotype of an enslaved person a minstrel character, often played by a white actor in black face makeup, portraying a bumbling, subservient buffoon. In 1896, the Supreme Court case Plessy versus Ferguson made the separation of the races legal. Now segregation in America had the full force of law. Lynching was a powerful form of intimidation used to keep blacks in their places. It is defined as a form of violence in which a mob under the present pretext of administrating justice without trial executes a presumed offender, often after inflicting torture. Between 1882 and 1951, more than 4,700 Americans were lynched. This image was created and distributed by the NAACP circa 1930s. Into the mix came an enterprising travel writer who had experienced the indignities of traveling while black. Victor Green, who worked for the Postal Service, compiled data on stores, motels, and gas stations in his native New York City area that welcomed black travelers publishing his first guide in 1936. He modeled the Green Book on similar guides developed for Jewish audiences. Green established a travel agency to book reservations at black owned establishments. By 1949, his guide included international destinations in Bermuda and Mexico, listing places for food, lodging, clothing, gas stations, beauty parlors and barbershops. 
Victor Green's mantra for the Green Book was a quote from Mark Twain. Travel is, a fatal, is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. The Green Book helped folks preserve their dignity, recommending suitable lodging, black friendly beaches, municipal golf courses, country clubs, and other activities of interest to the growing black middle class. His Harlem-based firm printed 15,000 copies a year, sold largely by mail and at Esso gas stations. A standard oil company was the first to franchise filling stations to people of color. Esso also hired blacks for management positions. The guide offered discounts for customers who mentioned the green book. And as you can see, it offered some detail on prospective accommodations and a breakdown by state. And now back to our story. Generations of people passed two simple stone markers standing silently on either side of a nondescript driveway in Kittery Point, Rock Rest, a humble cape and unattached garage with simple trim. Most never realized the significance of the painted signs, but for hundreds of weary vacationers from away, it marked a sanctuary from an indifferent world. These are the two people who made tonight's story possible. They were pioneers, small business owners, entrepreneurs. Clayton Sinclair hailed from South Carolina. He worked as a chauffeur for a New York family who summered in Maine. On one of those trips in 1930s, he was introduced to Hazel Colbert, who was from Baltimore. She served as a lady's maid for a Manhattan family that spent the warmer months in York. They courted, fell in love like people do, and then they married, making friends among members of the Black com community in nearby Portsmouth. They decide to make their home here in the area where they first met. In 1936, Clayton happened on a rundown cape in a bit less than two acres of land with exposed ledge in Kittery Point out by the edge of town. Excited by his find, he brought his new bride to see the place. Hazel Sinclair was not impressed. Calling it a shack and refusing to set up housing until he made suitable renovations, which included adding electricity and running wa water for a proper bathroom. By 1940, the Sinclairs had settled in, transforming the shack into a warm and welcoming home. Clayton worked at the Portsmouth shipyard, serving in the Navy during the war in one of the only roles available to black men at that time as a civilian chauffeur, later driving an ambulance. In his spare time, he demolished an old garage, replacing with a freestanding building big enough for two vehicles. Hazel was also employed at the shipyard during the war as a woodworker's helper, polishing her culinary skills at home, taking advantage of fruit trees and a vegetable garden lovingly tended by her husband. Over time, they made small additions to their home, enlarging the garage several times, adding guest space above and another shed on the property that would house tools and a small, small flock of chickens, fresh eggs in the morning. Before long, the Sinclairs found themselves putting up an occasional friend or relative who was unable to get overnight accommodations in Maine or New Hampshire. The US Census tells us that in 1950, people of color made only 1% of Maine's population. Again, there was de facto segregation even in New England, which meant if you had dark skin, you were routinely refused lodging, meals and basic services that today we take for granted. Confident with her cooking skills, Hazel launched a business literally from her kitchen table. Catering events for the summer people with some jobs continuing into the holiday season. By the time the war was over, their house featured a working fireplace for chilly evenings and a new porch with rocking chairs. Realizing that Black vacationers were seeking safe and welcoming accommodations, the Sinclair settled on the name Rock Rest, and the couple started taking in strangers, referred by friends of friends who wanted to visit New England for a week or two between Memorial Day and Labor Day. All visitors booked in advance. There was no walk-ins, as you would see at a boarding house. Now, Hazel kept detailed notes, and from her writing, we know that over the years, 
They hosted travelers from 28 states, some from as far away as Florida and Wisconsin. This is a page from a shopping list in 1956. Mrs. Sinclair managed the guest house business from menu planning and all preparations to taking reservations, bookkeeping and housekeeping, bringing in high school age help during the busy months. Laundry was sent out and groceries delivered. Hazel's notebooks tracked summer guests carefully recording who visited and when they stayed. Gretchen Soren's book, Driving While Black, includes a list of expenditures at rock rest from for China, crystal stemware and linens and Hazel's carefully calculated profits for each season. You know from listening to a tape interview from the 1980s that Hazel had shopped locally with many of the provisions coming from Frisbee's Market in Pepperell Cove, which was America's oldest family owned grocery store. Guests at Rockrest would expect fresh in season fruit like Maine blueberries and vegetables local seafood, fresh bread, milk, and eggs. The Sinclairs never relied on travel guides like the Green Book, yet they were generally full for the entire three month season. At the height of its popularity, there were room for 16 people between the main house and the garage. Typically, the guests were adult couples who arrived in their own cars filled with everything they needed for a visit to Maine. In 1957, for $40 a week, you would get a clean room, shared bathroom with a hearty breakfast and three course meal. That was dinner. The price in 1973 was still an affordable $85. Now as co-owner of Rockrest, Clayton Sinclair was the kitchen gardener, landscaper, facilities manager and after dinner hosts. Vacationers found solace in quiet, isolated setting at Rock Rest. They could relax with doctors, lawyers, teachers, and clergy members from New York, Philadelphia, and Baltimore. Valerie Cunningham, who grew up in Portsmouth, spent two summers as a teenager waiting on guests, setting the tables for meals, making beds, serving food, and carefully arranging fresh cut flowers. She was surprised to hear the professionals engage in spirited conversation on some of the same issues that were being discussed around her family's kitchen table, racial discrimination, community problems, finding housing and employment and dealing with the police. Sounds familiar even today, doesn't it? Hazel and Clayton created a place where guests could relax out of harm's way to be themselves. The guests in turn served as role models to the high school students, as well as their own son, demonstrating how far young people could go in the world. Rock Rest visitors were much like the people from away who stayed at the Grand Hotels along the main New Hampshire seacoast. In addition to socializing, they pitched horseshoes out back or played croquet. There was a table in the garage that served multiple roles hosting table tennis matches and evening card games. The rec room offered board games and stuffed chairs that encouraged con conversations on cool rainy days. In good weather, day trips included the nearby beaches or the White Mountains for sightseeing and shopping. They were in Kittery Point on a Sunday. Some guests attended the Black Baptist Church down the road in Portsmouth where the couples worshiped in the off season. Maine's short summers left time for leisure. When Rock Rest shut down for the season in September, the Sinclairs took a well-deserved vacation, either driving across North America or relaxing on a cruise ship. While traveling, the couple carried a copy of the Green Book to help navigate unfamiliar territory. The book Driving Wild Black describes Hazel's displeasure with a fish dinner served by the owner of a listed restaurant in Ohio as well as the troubles the Sinclairs encountered trying to reserve hotels or motel rooms along the West Coast. Both were personally active in the Seacoast civic and faith communities most of their lives, helping to found the Seacoast NAACP in 1958, where Mr. Sinclair volunteered as treasurer. Clayton served at the Kittery Planning Board, was a deacon and held various administrative offices of the church. He was a member of Prince Hall Freemasons in Boston, a historically significant chapter 
formed in 1784 for Blacks excluded from the English Masonic Fraternal Group. Hazel served on the Church Missionary Society and other administrative offices and was a member of York League of Women Voters. Their only child, Clayton Jr., graduated from Trape Academy in 1951 and the University of Maine, later earning a law degree from Howard in Washington, a historically black college and university, becoming a senior attorney in the office of Maynard Jackson. The Sinclair's reputation spread far and wide. There was a group of women from Boston who planned a special visit every year to Rockrest. No doubt their weekend trip included Hazel's lobster thermidor, one of the many special meals that she lovingly prepared in her kitchen for guests who had become lifelong friends. As you can see, the Sinclairs lived an active life. They stopped taking guests at Rockrest in 1977 but the business had been falling off since the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, opening up new options for black vacationers. The legislation ended segregation in public places, banning employment discrimination on the basis of race, religion, color, sex, or national origin. Sadly, the legislation helped siphon customers away from black owned and operated businesses like theirs. The couple was getting older, thinking about retirement, and their son had started his own family in Atlanta. Clayton Sinclair passed away in 1978. Hazel Sinclair lived in the house, continuing to share her story until she died in 1995. Eventually, the family sold Rockrest to a private buyer who has been working to update the home so it's not available for public tours. The good news is that many important bits of their history are preserved in various locations. For example, 24 linear feet of documents, correspondence, photographs, guest registers, account books, receipts, and personal papers, much of it in Hazel Sinclair's own handwriting was donated to the University of New Hampshire's Diamond Library where they are available for researchers. One of the two painted rocks that mark each end of the driveway seen here is today part of the collection of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Thanks to the tireless efforts of academic and community leaders, several items from the single hairs home are now part of the collection at the Smithsonian Museum's newest gallery building located along the National Mall. The museum's first wisery curator, Bill Pretzer, called Rockrest a prime example of a tourist setting from the 1950s to 1960s, representing what middle-class African-Americans wanted and could afford to buy. From the screen porch in Rockrest, the museum has various decorative objects with seacoast themes. From the main house came paintings, including table settings familiar to generations of vacationers, as well as objects the Sinclairs brought back from the American Southwest and other trips. The collection includes some of Hazel's well-loved regional cookbooks and travel diary. There are even croquet sets, cribbage boards, baseball bats, and fishing poles, all reminders of a time when Black Americans were drawn to this welcoming place in Kittery Point. Now Rockrest, which is de designated on the map by the Blue Star, was not the only business offering overnight accommodations for Black vacationers in Southern New York County. Even though these establishments served the same market, the owners were not in competition, knew one another, and helped out in a pinch. For instance, a bit up the road in York, the Jewel Inn was operated by a West Indian gentleman named Mr. Samuda, who lived in Boston during the winter. He offered small private cabins with meals served in a central lodge. Jerry Talbot's book, Maine's Visible Black History, notes that the Sinclairs often directed their guests to the Jewel Inn to meet other tourists and dance to the jukebox. The old York Historical Society recently shared this copy of an advertisement from a chamber booklet from the early 1960s. It shows that the Jewel Inn on Ridge Road in York Beach served meals to the general public. Moving northward, 
In Ogankut, a black actress and painter, Ethel Good, welcomed guests to her home near the center of town, seen in this recent photo where she could accommodate up to 35 guests as long as they didn't mind sleeping on the couch. According to Maine's visible black history, Langston Hughes, the esteemed writer, poet, and social activist stayed at her place during the rehearsals and performances of one of his productions at the Playhouse. Good, who was also a playwright, later married and was known as Ethel Franklin. Today, her home is known as the Hideaway Inn Bed and Breakfast. Here's a third surviving guest house in Old Orchard Beach. It was run for several decades by Rose Emerson Cummings and her husband, Charles Edward Cummings Jr. It was known simply as 110. Those walls house several famous jazz musicians who perform at the Pier Casino or one of the town's many grand hotels where they had to enter through the back door and were barred from overnight stays. Count Basie, Cab Calloway, Duke Ellington either stayed there or used the piano for rehearsals where, while performing locally. The Cummings Guest House and Rock Rest are both listed in the National Register of Historic Places. 110 was in business until the late 1980s, early 90s. It has since been sold and recently remodeled. There are a number of resources that we draw on to develop tonight's presentation. The first is Driving Wild Black by Gretchen Soren, a professor at the State University of New York. The book is a well-researched and footnoted examination of the social, economic, and political history of African-Americans and the automobile. The book was published in 2020 and can be purchased at the Black Heritage Trails office in Portsmouth at 222 Court Street. By the way, Ms. Soren helped curate a recent exhibit at the Portsmouth Discovery Center. Cross Grain and Wiley Waters, a guide to the Piscataqua Maritime Region is an illustrated paperback by Jeffrey Bolster, a professor at UNH, published by the Gondolo Company. A colorful guide to the history of the Great Bay Estuary, the anthology includes a section on rock rest. I have to mention to others, the Portsmouth native who was close enough to Mrs. Sinclair to call her Aunt Hazel helped provide a wealth of information on rest, rock rest, including many other personal photos. That would be Valerie Cunningham. Last but not least, my co-presenter, Bob Shepard, a former journalist. He researched many of the photos for tonight's presentation. A big thank you, Bob. And produced a slide presentation, a Kittery Point resident who once interviewed the co-owner of Rockrest, is currently working on a documentary of his father's experience as an original Tuskegee Airman. On behalf of the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire, we thank the Lane Library for offering, offering us the opportunity to share the story of Hazel and Clayton Sinclair with you tonight. I'm not sure how we're doing on time. Perhaps we can have some questions now. Doing great on time. It is 7.31. Ah. So I have it set up so that um, I'm asking you to share your questions via the Zoom chat. But if you want to raise your hand um, and let me know if you'd like to maybe verbalize your question, we can go ahead and, and try that out also possibly as well. So either raise your hand or type in chat um, and let us know if you have any questions. I see we have Valerie Cunningham on the line. We do, yes. All right, so from Mary, did they receive any pushback from the town? That's a good question. Uh, not that I've heard of. Uh, living in Kittery, I've had an opportunity to talk with a number of folks on working on this project in the last month or so. And I think people knew who they were. Uh, again, as Noor mentioned in the presentation, Rockrest was kind of off on the corner of the town up towards the York line. Uh, people seemed to know them. They were very personable. Uh, they helped in the community. I talked to somebody who said that she commuted into work at the shipyard with Clayton Sinclair as well. So I, I think that they, uh, they were well known and, and pretty well respected. 
The same, basically the same question, but with local residents as well. So I think that kind of is covered though with what you said. You know, one thing I can, I, I was mentioning a little earlier to NUR, one of the fascinating things about working on this is you, you start to uncover little bits and pieces of the history. And I spoke to somebody uh, last week who was a member of the class of 1951 at Trape Academy, the high school here in town. And that's where their son, uh, Clayton Jr., uh, attended for high school. And when he was graduating, uh, they were going to take a class trip and go down to Washington, D.C. And they found out that the last minute that the hotel that they had booked for their stay wouldn't allow African-Americans. This was in the spring of 1951. So the class took up a vote and said, you know, either we're going to find some place where uh, Clayton Jr. can stay with us or we're going to cancel the trip altogether. They were able to, to arrange those, make those reservations. And she showed me this photo, a class photo of the class. And you can see Clayton Jr. is in the back. He's the only African-American member of the class. And he's standing two people away from Margaret Chase Smith, who was a senator from the state of Maine. So it's kind of neat when you start to work on a project like this uh, and start to talk about some people doing some of the, the reading. And of course, having an incredible resource like Valerie Cunningham. Mm. Uh, we've been able to uncover a lot of really interesting great information and certainly the photos as well. So our next question is, uh, where are the items located that are in the photos, uh, like the tag chairs that appear to, appear to be in a house? Um, are they at UNH as well? No, I don't believe they are at UNH. I, mm, I know some of them are at the museum, uh, the African American Museum of History and Culture I'm not sure. Yeah, I know that the, the rock is on display, but you know, it's a, it's a big museum and there are lots of, of items. So a lot of these items are probably in the collection somewhere stored away and maybe brought out for special occasions and the like. But if you go to the museum now, I think that that's the current exhibit. So you, you'll actually see the rock and uh, some displays about uh, travel guides, the green book and the like. Yeah, that is what they have. I have been to the museum. Yeah, you just see the rock. Um, were you guys? Valerie, I hate to put you on the spot, but do you know where the chairs might be? Let me go ahead and, and um, I have to let her change. Change a setting, one second. Uh, <laughs> while, I, while I do that, um, does anybody know if the BB, um, if the BB the, in that, the bed and breakfast that Ethel Good ran, um, who owns it? Is in it? Is it still in their family? No, it's it's probably owned. And if you go to the website of the uh, bed and breakfast, the Hideaway Inn bed and breakfast, they actually have a little write up on Ethel Good to try to tie it into the history of the, the location. But it's privately owned. I think I'm unmuted now. Yes, yes you are. <laughs> Uh, those those uh, patio chairs, the wicker chairs, they are at the museum in D.C. Awesome. In Valerie, fact, if you want to come those, on, you definitely can. All of those uh, things that you see that have little white tags hanging on them, they're mm -hmm. tagged to go to the museum. This is when we were clearing out the house for the new owner to take over. Mm -hmm. And uh, the curator came to Kittery Point from the museum. <laughs> uh, he was there four days after he found out about found the, out about the the story of Rock Rest, and because uh, they wanted to be sure to get what they wanted. So they those those are some of the items you notice the uh, croquet set there. Mm -hmm. And they got some of the fishing rods and game boards. And they wanted to take items that were typical of this place. So they weren't interested in cups and saucers and chinaware, even though we thought that they were very precious. They are precious to us, but it's not something that they were interested in. Valerie, someone did ask if um, the repeated entries that shows Valerie twelve dollars is is that you? And can you mm -hmm. elaborate on those? <laughs> yeah, that was my weekly pay. Well paid. Yep, I I worked there 
two summers. Sharon Jones, the singer, our local celebrity, she also worked there. Not the, they, she a, a, a different summer than when I was there. Mm -hmm. And Mrs. Sinclair also had a niece who lived in Baltimore, Maryland. But when she was a young girl, she would come and help help out her auntie. Oh. Valerie, maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the food. It, it, uh, I know that in talking with Hazel, I had an opportunity to interview her back in the 80s and learn a little bit about her time there. But she was really well known for her cooking skills, wasn't she? Oh, yes, she's, she definitely was. In fact, off season, uh, that uh, she did catering mm -hmm. to the uh, wealthy um, year round people who lived around Kittery Point. York area mm -hmm. and those whatever she was cooking for them is what she would cook for her own guests during the summer so they they ate uh three course breakfasts and four course dinners you know it was it was um high class stuff I think Sharon uh, Noor, what did Sharon tell you about it? Yes, Sharon uh, Jones told me that uh, the Waldorf Hotel in New York had nothing on the Sinclairs, she said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and they really were entrepreneurs. I mean, this was a tough time uh, during the 1940s and 1950s. People were trying to make, you know, do everything they could to, to get by. And that's part of the reason that they opened their, their house to folks. But, you know, she had this side business on the side, catering and things like that. She was a very enterprising woman for the time. Did their son stay in the Kittery area? This is one of the questions we have. No, he moved. That was one of the things that was on the presentation. Yeah, he went to the University of Maine. He started his family though, down south somewhere. Yeah, yeah he was in Atlanta. He, uh, he went to Howard University in, in Washington, D.C., and then he uh, entered the practice of law in Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. This is more of an observation, I guess, and the question. Um, it's interesting that Trape was not segregated, question mark. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question. You know, um, there were obviously Blacks in the Navy during the war. They had uh, blacks that were, you know, porters. I mean, there were only certain jobs that African Americans were allowed to have during World War II, and it was segregated. So there, it was likely that there were African Americans that were living in the area. Um, and and I, I guess it's it's always been a, a bit of an embracing community. Valerie might know a little bit more about that. Yes. Well, oh yeah, there were there were black families living. In, uh, all over the place <laughs> mm -hmm. in uh but in the seacoast area sure right. in relatively small numbers and there also were a number of blacks in the, in the marines who had a, a pretty good sized contingent at the shipyard during yeah. the war and valerie and, did you not go to trade no you were in portsmouth you went to portsmouth high school correct that's, that's right yeah right I think at that point, they're probably, I mean, where would they have sent them if, you know, if they said, well, you cannot attend, you know, trade, where would that, there wasn't enough to build another school. I don't know where they would have gone. Oh, no, there, there, there weren't enough, uh, there weren't enough black people in yeah. northern New England, any place in northern New England to have separate schools. Right. There's a question about um, basically the basically the, the identifying markers are, are no longer at the prop. Correct. They they are both gone. No, one is one is at the museum, but one is still there, and <laughs> she's <laughs> she. Uh, the current owner was very upset that I allowed them to take one, <laughs> but then when she saw it, that it actually was on exhibit, then. She was, she was okay. She said, okay, that's all right then. <laughs> and is there a historic marker that's paired with that as well, like a plaque or any sort of thing like that there also? Well, not at this time because uh, it, it's been taking, it's taking her a, a long time 
to get this house uh, back looking the way she wants it to. And in fact, right now, hmm, well, I might be letting the cat out of the bag, <laughs> but uh, her intention is to restore the garage and have that open again some at some time as a Airbnb. Mm. So at that time, I'm sure there will, you know, we will have a marker there. Yeah, and this is a fairly current shot of the house. Uh, and as you can see, the, the rock rest sign is there. It's a little bit faded. Yeah. And this woman has done a lot of the work herself. She's a very capable, <laughs> uh, handy woman. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, it, is, it takes some time because she had to bring everything up to code and, and all that. But she very carefully tried to maintain the same footprint. And for me to walk in there, it still feels like good old rock rest. So I, I praise her highly for the work she's done. Mm -hmm. Did the Sinclairs keep a guest book? And are there any written accounts from guests? Oh, yeah. There are, all of that is at UNH in the archives. And that uh, the one that you saw with my name on it, that's one of her, that's her weekly um, account book. It was, a bit, it was a bit of everything. It was an account book and a guest book. Well, she had, no, the guest books were separate. And her own private, you know, travel notes and, and such. That, that was only for her summer business. She was a good bookkeeper. Mm. And she was pretty savvy. I mean, she even, they put together some color postcards that she would send out to folks or, or give to some of the guests that they could send back to folks back in Baltimore, New York, and Philadelphia. And that was part of the way they advertised or marketed the business. It was pretty yeah. savvy. Oh, yes. I think we've got a color picture of what it looked like. What sort of places would uh, visitors have went to on the seacoast? What they might have went out and if they had went out to do? Oh, they went to the usual tourist places. They, there was no problem with people traveling around and seeing the sights uh, during the day. But, you know, they, they were... And that's why the, the, the Sinclairs served both breakfast and dinner. So right. when they were out, uh, when their guests were out sightseeing, they didn't have to worry about meals because they were, <laughs> they were covered at, back at Rock Rest. But uh, they, uh, you know, they'd visit the historic house museums in Portsmouth and uh, go to the beach and do the things that everybody else does when they go. I'm not, uh, I'm not from this area, so I'm not sure what kind of, I, 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 my mind goes to Yonkins, Yonkins, I, can't, I don't even remember. Yonkins. Yonkins, yeah. yeah. I didn't even know, was that, was that open at the right time period? And then like, what, maybe down at the beach, what maybe? Yeah, Yonkins was open, but that's not someplace that, you know, they, didn't, they weren't going any place else to eat. Mm because they got the best food. <laughs> what they got at Rock Rest would put Yokins to shame, believe me. <laughs> what about the Wentworth? This is a question from, from a... Well, uh, well, uh, well, the Wentworth was segregated. They definitely weren't going to get into the Wentworth in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, we, in fact, the Portsmouth NAACP integrated the Wentworth in 1964. Um, and so, uh, yeah, their service, their meal service would be comparable to, uh, the, the, but realize now when the guests go, went to rock rest, mm -hmm. they paid a certain amount for their, they usually stayed for a week, but whether mm -hmm. they stayed for a weekend or a week. Their breakfast and their dinner was included in their um, bill. Mm -hmm. So they weren't going to go off and eat 
any place else because no place else was better. And and uh, Mrs. Sinclair also gave them the usual main thing. You know, they had their lobster and blueberry pie and mm -hmm. and uh, fish dinners and so forth. Did they? I'm going to ask a private question that I have, and then um, there is another question that did come in. Did did they? Did do people have like a favorite beach? I feel like that is a thing up here in in this part of New England. Everyone has their favorite beach that they like to go to. Yeah, they could go to the beach. They didn't have any problem on the beach. Yeah, you know, Sea Point Beach in Kittery is not very far. Yeah. Uh, okay. The if, yes, there was yeah. one that they yeah. they, they like to go, they could the go to New York. Okay. If they wanted to, but Sea Point was convenient. Mm -hmm. Did either Mr. or Mrs. Sinclair have other jobs, or was Ruckress sufficient to support them? Uh, Mr. Sinclair worked full time at the shipyard. And uh, she worked full time at her at Rock Rest during the summer. During off season, uh, she was she stayed at home, and she had uh, catering jobs, but she didn't work anyplace else during the off season. She was busy doing her community service then, working right. with the community. Except during the war, she did, uh, for the time during the war, she did work at the shipyard. But oh, I'm yeah. guessing that's because not too many people were probably traveling because of the war. Well, mm -hmm. she hadn't really gone full time into her guest house Business, at sure. at that sure. time. Yeah. And uh, I mean, there, a lot of women were working at the shipyard then because the men were off at war. Right. Any other questions? I have, Mark says, whoa, fantastic, fa uh, fascinating story, rich content, well-organized, lavishly illustrated and clearly delivered. Thank you to Noor for your presentation and to all who contributed to putting this together. It was my pleasure. Thank you, Bob and Valerie, and everybody else that joined us. Thank you for coming. And if I may plug in, we also, if you want to learn more about uh, Black history, we have tours at Black Heritage Trail. They're listed on our website. Please come and um, join us on our tours. They're starting next month. Awesome, we're getting, we're getting lots of thank yous, of course. And um, to everybody, yes, please, if you have a moment, uh, fill out that online form that we have uh, for our, our program. And of course, thank you so much to Noor and Bob today for joining us mm -hmm. and, and putting together this amazing presentation. I very much enjoyed it. And Valerie, thank you so much for joining us as well. We're so, I mean, firsthand account, that's always the most exciting part of, of um, history is when you have someone that was there and can share it. So thank you so much. Definitely. Thank you, thank Stacy. Yeah, thank you, Stacy. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Yeah. So I think we're all done.